I'm Larry Cooperman. I'm Director of Business Development at Night Dive Studios. And I am Stephen Kick. I am the CEO of Night Dive Studios and the Director of System Shock Remake. So guys, it's getting closer to getting this thing released and out the door. Like, Talk about the updates and things you've been working on since we last spoke. Well, mostly it's been optimization, making sure that the game runs really smoothly on all of our targeted platforms, uh, finishing any kind of polish that we've got remaining. Um, yeah, just basically putting the putting the wrapping and the ribbon on. What's it been like seeing, I mean, you had a demo out and people have actually been able to see a lot of the gameplay. Well, you know, that demo came out quite a long time ago and the feedback that we're still receiving from it is extremely positive. And the difference between our launch version of the game and that demo is going to be night and day. Um, we've just put so much more into it. Um, we've really listened to all the feedback that we receive from, you know, minor annoyances to uh, gameplay features that were requested. And we've really done our best to accommodate uh, just about all the, the good feedback that we received. So it's I think that, uh, yeah, when, when people get their hands on the final version, um, it's going to feel like a entirely new experience. One of the uh, one of the reasons why the the demo was so important to us is because we had um, we had had to do a couple of changes in direction on the game. I don't want to use the term pivots because um, I don't think that that's accurate. Um, I think that we 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 elicited a lot of fan feedback. We know how important this game is to our our key demographic, uh, to our target audience, and um, and when when the original you know when we we had originally gone down the road we originally started the feedback that we got was was kind of negative that um it was cool but it was not what people had backed um that really caused us to change direction and so we've been very conscious of making sure that we not only incorporate fan feedback as, as Stephen has said but that we'd be very true to the direction of what our fans expectations are no, it is very difficult because you're not doing like a uh, like an HD, you know, remaster. This is a complete remake from the ground up. And and for how old System Shock is, and there are older games in System Shock, but there are some games that just don't translate well to modern uh, techniques. A good example is the Twisted Metal series. Loved that series growing up. Playing it now, oof, it's rough. It's really rough. Uh, how do you avoid those tropes when you're remastering it's such an old game to give it all the modern designs and conveniences, but at the same time, not make those really old fans upset that it's being changed. It's been a balancing act for sure. We've been attracted to a lot of the original, like you say, the tropes, a lot of the mechanics and a lot of the older conventions that were that were new and novel uh, when System Shock first came out in 1994. And we've done our best to keep them in the, like maintain that as part of the experience but smooth out the edges uh, as much as we can so that they don't become, you know, annoying um, <laughs> hindrances. One, one of the things that's given us a, a, an advantage on that and it's given us some, some insights that, that have proved really valuable is because we're the publisher of um, the Enhanced Edition of System Shock um, and, and have been for a number of years. Um, we, we've been able to get from the fans feedback on both the things that they consider key and important in the game and the things that, boy, they wish that that the technology back all those years ago had had allowed them to implement and to change. That and the fact that we've uh, we've we've worked with um, and received feedback from both um, Warren Spector and Paul Neurath on the game has really been helpful. Talk about like the, the one of the things that makes your game stand out, in my opinion, in a good way is the use of color. Um, I mean, horror games usually don't have a lot of color in it, with the exception of maybe Bioshock. Uh, they use a lot of the neon lights, a lot of the vibrant colors and stuff like that. It actually was very colorful. Um, every deck had its own unique palette of kind of vibrant 80s, early 90s hues. And we did our best to to, to maintain that because we felt that that was a major part of the visual identity of System Shock. And like you said, a lot of horror games tend to rely on chromatic palettes and they kind of don't stray from the darker tones and, and, uh, and lighting. And we wanted to make sure that in a lineup of screenshots, you know exactly what game you were looking at uh, when you saw a screenshot of System Shock. 
Now, why does a game like like what why does any remaster in particular take take so long? Uh, a remake takes so long to make. Can you give like a little perspective? Because I know there's some very impatient games out there that they want it now. They've seen the demo. They want to play it right now. They don't want to wait another year or whatever. What's like the biggest misconception on their side? What they don't realize is happening during the remake of this game? That's a really good question. I mean, like Larry kind of mentioned before, we've had a bunch of starts and stops along the way uh, because there were a lot of different and varying opinions about how we should interpret the original System Shock in a remake. And we kind of let the fans and, and our backers kind of guide those decisions ultimately by um, by the feedback that they that they gave us. It, you know, when we started showing them the various uh, updates that we had along the way and they saw us kind of veer away from what we had originally pitched in our Kickstarter and they showed their displeasure in, in so many ways, you know, that, that, was a, that was a full stop kind of moment. Like, wow, we kind of screwed this up. We need to circle back and we need to figure out you know, what we were doing right and why people were entrusting us in this project to begin with. And we need to, we need to see it through the right way. And so a lot of projects, I would say, they don't have so many starts and stops. They, their, their development is probably thankfully in a more linear kind of fashion than, than ours was. Um, I'm just grateful that we were enabled the opportunity to go back and make those drastic changes. Uh, because, you know, I would say, a lot of the time making such a dramatic shift in, in development is often leads to the death of a game and in our case that wasn't you know that wasn't an option for one thing but um we were afforded that opportunity and we could really f listen to the fans and, and the backers and and we could make those changes but it came at a cost of a length of development not 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 to mention a monetary cost unfortunately yeah. well, fortunately you know fortunately we've we've had uh, a quite a great deal of, of success with our with our other projects um so we you know we were not going to push this out the door early greg i was also going to say um you're, you're you're spot on um regarding the number of fans that that want the game out now if not if not yesterday but um very often those are the same fans that also also want it to be nothing short of perfection on it on immediate release yeah that that can be rough and like you said you're you're juggling multiple projects it's not like you're you're one studio doing focusing on one game and substantial dlc for that game it's it's you're juggling remakes and remasters and you're doing business meetings and pitches and all this other stuff which you're working on next you're juggling a lot of projects is it hard to deal with so much and work on this remaster oh we just never sleep <laughs> yeah that's that's the correct answer yeah there you go we just you know, who needs sleep um, I would like to I would like to point out that um, as as crazy as as we knew it was going to be, um, the the actuality has has even been been crazier because of the projects that we did for Bethesda. Um, we had to juggle around some of our our own um, projects that that you know were purely night dive projects. So here we are. We're, we're not even at the midway point of of 2022. And um, we've already released um, three titles this year. Um, you know, Shadow Man, Power Slave, and uh, and Wheel of Time that we did in uh, in partnership with GOG. Um, we have an, another one slated for uh, June. Um, we'll we'll let you know about that one as soon as the time is right. Um, but you know, our, our schedule has been has been nothing short of crazy. That said, um, we're fortunate again. Um, it's it's because of the success that we've had with with our our other projects that we have two completely um, different development teams. So there are shared resources and and the same and people do work on on multiple projects. But System Shock, the System Shock Remake has has a completely separate development team um, working in Unreal, whereas um, the 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 games that we've been releasing to this point have been predominantly from our Kex team. So those those are two separate, you know, two separate silos, as they say. How big, like, because you guys aren't small and you're definitely not like 4,000 large, but like, how big is your team? Like how many resources are you able to allocate and move around between, you know, design and coders and producers and everything like that? There are about 45 um, people in total um, at Night Dive that are, you know, roughly what we like to say full-time equivalents. Um, uh, we permit people to have their own side projects and um, you know we, we certainly encourage that many of them are, are in the classic games area 
Um, we also um, do use some outsourcing and we have other people that come on on a uh, as needed basis. So for someone who's never played a System Shock game, System Shock 1 or 2, like will they will people be able to go into this remake and understand everything that happened in the original as far as story goes and characters and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we start it right from the same spot that the that the original does. Uh, but we decided to take that entire cinematic opening from the original and make it a, a playable uh, a playable experience. So instead of just seeing, you know, third person uh, vignettes of the hacker on his computer, uh, you get to play as the hacker in his apartment in New Atlanta uh, for a brief moment of time before he's abducted by Citadel security and, and, and brought to the station. But uh, we use that as um, just another way of um, expanding the the exposition and, and the original story and, and just kind of filling it out and making it feel like a more lived in space um, as opposed to, again, just a, an intro cinematic that you see in, in the original. I will, uh, I'll tell you, of, of all the people on the System Shock team, um, I had uh, probably the, the least experience. I know that that sounds pretty ironic, um, but I pro had, had probably the, the least experience with the System Shock franchise. Um, my, my work was, was on acquisition and contract stuff on that. Um, so if you, you ask me questions about the uh, legal documents, those I'm great at, but uh, I needed some help getting out of medical level. Uh, uh, so, but, you know, but the game is, is understandable and comprehensible. And, and as Steve has pointed out, I mean, for somebody playing it from a, a raw perspective, I, I found it, um, you know, immediately engaging. I, I want to use the, the term immersive on that. Dystopian sci-fi is like almost more popular now than it was when, when System Shock originally came out. So uh, I, I'm, I'm just curious, do you think like from a from a cultural perspective that the franchise is more relevant now than it was when it first came out? Or is it at a, is it at a similar level? Like where do you feel like, like System Shock's narrative like fits into like modern society? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna also ask Steve to respond on that, but but I'm gonna give you give you my response on that. Um, the the concept now, um, you know, what we're referring to is dystopian about the threats that are that are uh, coming from uh, AI, from um, technology companies that are that are out of control. Um, I think it's I think it's more real now, and it it it's more impactful. In people's lives, I mean, I think I think that the average player can go, yeah, I've already felt that. There's a, you know, to kind of piggyback on that. I mean, the, one of the biggest themes of System Shock is the idea of isolation, when in reality you're being watched all the time. And so I think that you know, just everybody's general concern over privacy is is a is a major touching point here um you're constantly being watched i mean one of the side goals of the, of the game is to destroy all the security cameras on each level because not only is shodan watching you through them like eyes uh but they control a lot of the the security on on each deck as well and i you know i have these moments where i'll just be talking with my wife um in front of our alexa about something kind of irrelevant and not a minute later I'll turn on my phone and there'll be an ad for whatever it was I was talking about and that really scares me and uh I think that's kind of the heart of uh of uh, of system shock and and the, the the threat and the um omnipresence I guess of of artificial intelligence it's somebody's always listening to you somebody's always watching and it's just it's unnerving well, let's hope Alexa never evolves to harvest our organs or anything like that. <laughs> you, uh, you're clearly not aware of the uh, Alexa 2.0 upgrade. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question I had is, you know, we've talked a lot about how, you know, fans and, you know, you've, you've spoken to like Warren Spector and stuff like that about sort of keeping the, the vibe proper in the game but i'm curious uh how, what modern games and modern franchise did you, did you look at uh when working 
uh, on on this remake, you know, because obviously like Bioshock was a, a spiritual, spiritual successor. successor. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I was curious, did you look at like the, the Bioshock franchise or anything like that when looking to sort of bring this into like the modern gaming zeitgeist? Actually, we the game that we referenced the most was System Shock 2. Uh, because we thought that that was almost the perfect evolution of the first game. And not that it peaked there, uh, but it definitely struck a chord with, with the vast majority of, of who were to become System Shock fans. Uh, you know, even now today, if you ask if anybody's played System Shock, they'll go, no, I didn't play the original, but I played two. And um, it was partly due to the accessibility of that game. I mean, it had mouse look built in. It came a number of years later after after Shock 1. And um, it was just more enjoyable to someone who was just ready to pick up and play a game that didn't want to um, have a steep learning curve in, in terms of just you know basic character movement and game mechanics. And so we took a look at how they translated, you know, what was essentially System Shock 1 and 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 uh, created Shock 2, and we borrowed a number of those elements and we brought them back to the remake and and the way that we've been looking at it is that shock remake is kind of a hybrid between the two titles it's almost like a shock 1.5 and um i think that we're going to kind of strike the perfect balance between the two in that respect but if we're talking purely modern titles we looked a lot at prey uh which is of course you know a lot of people will regard that as a system shock successor or spiritual successor uh, we looked at deus ex of course uh war inspector's title um and the and the, the future versions that came out from um from eidos and square enix um i'm trying to think of what else larry do any other titles kind of come to mind that that were a big influence on what, what we're doing Prey was the one that that, that jumped up because we've we've all spoken about that. Um, uh, the other thing that that I would say is, um, I, I would guess the majority of people on our team have have also played. I mean, it, it was not it was not an influence for us, but it was something that was you know certainly in our consciousness about Cyberpunk. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an obvious one. Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. And uh, the other thing that that um, and, and and Blake, I'll, I'll I'll follow up and and uh, and send you some stuff on this. But um, I, I've you know also contributed a little bit talking about some of the the science fiction themes of science fiction, um, particularly you know from authors that, that people might not know, like Walter John Williams. Um, there there have been some really influential themes. It's really funny though. Um, back back all those years ago, you know, you really had to explain to people what the um, the theme was about a, you know, about an, a, an artificial intelligence um, taking over. Oh, uh, in, in science fiction, I mean, certainly the uh, the Gibson trilogy, the Neuromancer trilogy. Um, but it's, it's funny that that back in the, in those days, you really had to explain to people why AI could be a threat and and what a hacker was and, and what that was about. And today, I mean, that's common parlance for people, so so everybody understands that. On a slightly unrelated topic uh this is just kind of something fun i discovered yesterday but i got invited to a um ai generated um, art program called mid journey and it's all built on discord and all you have to do is basically give the computer a couple of prompts like just descriptors like words phrases pretty much anything you want and in about 30 seconds it gives you four pieces of unique artwork based on that, that then you can refine uh, simply by clicking a couple of buttons. And it's amazing what this thing is capable of. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys because it's oh, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful use of the technology, but I could also see where someone might, you know, find some other use for that. I mean, <laughs> it's a little bit scary. Yeah, yeah no, that's something really interesting. I actually have an artist friend that has been doing that using Unreal and a, and a program that he has to create unique pieces of art. And the iterations, the more iterations you get it, like the more refined it becomes. So you yeah. kind of see the primitive evolution of something that looks like maybe it was like, it had, like you know, finger painted by a kid into these very like almost, it's like almost dreamlike. 
yes. a lot of times when you see that stuff, you know, it's interesting. Um, and I think it really does kind of go back to system shock where you have like, you know, a AI with a neural network, like interpreting things and things like that. Yeah, I mean, Shodan didn't do it with artwork. She just did it with our genes. I mean, you know. What's same, what, same thing. <laughs> yeah. What do they say? It's not It's not if we're replaced by machines, it's when we're replaced by machines. As we start to rapidly get more, you know, we'll, we'll all be out of a job eventually because machine learning will do it for us, right? Well, That's perhaps, the... perhaps System Shock is a, a, is a training a game yeah. plan to help us survive. Well, you know, in terms of game development, when I was playing with this tool, I was like, wow, you know, I just got a piece of concept art in about 30 seconds. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if an entire game is created using this method one day. I would, uh, I would, I would joke, but it's really not, not funny. Uh, I, I, I would joke that, you know, and we fire two artists after that, but yeah, you know, I, I, I think, I think that that's, uh, that's not too far off into the, into the future. No, go, you know, we talked about, you know, you know, how you guys get the rights to, you know, certain games when you remake them or re release them, you know, and sometimes it's a partner deal with like Bethesda and the Doom series. But in, in this uh, System Shock remake specifically, was it hard make, getting the rights to that? I mean, it was it, uh, if you can talk about it, were they shared rights? Did you get the IP out outright? Like, how did that process work? So there's a, a very complicated uh, backstory to that. Um, one that uh, um, would 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 merit uh, a, a post mortem, you know, on its on its own. Um, but uh, the rights the rights ended up. Um, so as always, the rights are complicated, but the, the trademark rights ended up with um, an insurance company. Um, it took uh, after after I had joined the after I had joined Night Dive. Um, so, so acquiring those rights was was uh, the first major task that that Steve gave me. It took um, well over a year of um, calls and email exchanges to acquire the rights from a company that we already had a relationship with because they were the licensor for the publishing rights on System Shock 2. So they, they already knew us, they, they knew you know that we were a reputable company, we had been working with them for a while, um, but even so it took quite a while um, for those those rights to, to come over to us. And um, and then, you know, in, in today's world, um, you know, people ask all the time, you know, what, what would happen, you know, what will come after after the System Shock remake and and at least potentially uh, a System Shock 2 remake, um, you know where where do we go next? And those rights are those rights currently currently are with Tencent. Um, they went from um, other side, uh, which you know which was something we felt very strongly about about returning the rights for future versions to the guys that made the original games. Um, but then they were they were subsequently sold to uh, to, to Tencent. Um, so that's that's where where those are now. So even even to this day, um, the rights situation is somewhat complicated. Do you see that like if if you when this releases and it sells a lot of copies and it's very successful, do you see that being kind of a hindrance in the future when you, if you do want to make a System Shock three, uh, having to approach Tencent and you know talk about hey look at these two games because they did so well, and Tencent might want a piece of that because people are weird about IP, especially big corporations. Sometimes they overvalue an IP. Even if it's been stagnant for 20 years, they still think it's worth whatever millions of dollars just to license, which is really odd. It it, it is. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, if if you asked um, in, in one you know one sentence to summarize the the secret of of Night Dive success is that we have been very very successful in building partnerships. Um, that's something that's that's really really important to us. Um, you know, the companies that we worked with back eight years ago are still companies that we work with today. Um, we have very strong, you know, personal relationships throughout the gaming industry. So it's it's perhaps less of an obstacle and more of, you know, at least a potential opportunity for us at Night Dive. Larry, when, uh, when does System Shock Remake come out and what platforms we, are you aiming for at launch? Um, the System Shock game will be released um, as soon as um, it, it is finished and complete and to our um, our satisfaction. And uh, it will be coming out uh, across PC, um, Xbox, PlayStation, and possibly other 
platforms to be announced at some future date. That's awesome. Larry, Stephen, thank you guys so much for talking with us today on System Shock. I know you guys are busy with multiple things. We really appreciate your time here. For more content, stay tuned right here at E6.